Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this session of the Work Like webinar series. Today we will be discussing mobile app design and user experience in a fragmented mobile landscape. This is clearly becoming a growing area of concern for all enterprises embarking on a mobile strategy. We will address the following issues during the webinar. We are joined today by Joram Rosner, CEO at Five, an international firm specializing in user experience whose work is widely used across the world, as well as Amit Ben Sheffer, Director of Product Management at Worklight. Uh, Worklight is a mobile application platform used by some of the largest companies in the world uh, to develop, run, and manage apps for smartphones and, and uh, tablets. Please submit your questions during the webinar using the console, and we will address these at the final part of the presentation. And with that, let me introduce Joram Rosner, CEO of Five. Thanks, Yoni. Okay, so let's talk about the mobile user experience. I will describe some of the behavioral and visual elements associated with a mobile user experience and we'll share best practices that will be useful in your current mobile initiative. While on the go, the, people, the way people interact with and use apps is totally different from what we know about desktop apps. First of all, while on, while on the go, users are, are always in a hurry. They are on their way to somewhere or in the midst of a conversation with somebody or anxious to like something in their Facebook app. Therefore, their sessions with apps are quick and short. People want to accomplish a task and go back to their main activity as soon as possible. In essence, the resulting user behavior on the go can be described as microtasking. Get the info item you need, perform the action you need, and quit. If that's not enough, then while microtasking, users are also faced with a multitude of distractions, be it notification dialogues pushed by other apps or phone calls that may arrive at the mobile device at any given time, same goes for text messages that may intervene maybe even several times during the session with our app. And on top of that, other people may interfere. When we are on the go, it is not like we are sitting in front of our PC at the office where people respect the fact that we need to concentrate. People will think twice before they bother us with whatever issues. I mean, they respect the fact that we are working. However, on the go, we do not seem working, do we? And therefore, we are subject to distractions from other people at all times. And of course, we try to accomplish this micro task while waiting for the train to, to arrive, but then it really arrived and we have to board. Therefore, we have to specifically design for the mobile state of mind. We have to achieve visual simplicity so that user understands what is expected of him in a split second. Furthermore, the micro-testing atmosphere requires that user achieve his goal in just a few print taps. One, two, three, and you are there. Otherwise, you know the train would arrive before him. And I am at the third bullet now. The app should have a distinct focus. Its primary task should be distilled and then catered to the audience in an optimal way. At the same time, the product's secondary features should never obstruct the flow. They should be exposed in a subdued fashion. And expendable features should better be totally removed. A product that does not maintain a clear focus will not survive the mobile state of mind. Take Shazam, for example. Shazam is a mobile app that is built around music. And uh, as you may expect, it can show top 10 charts, provide song lyrics, allow purchase of songs in Amazon. However, Shazam has one predominant feature. It can listen to any song using the phone mic and come up with info about the song, its title, performer, lyrics. And yes, the creator of Shazam were clever enough to craft a well-focused primary task around this predominant feature. Please look at the screenshot marked from 1 to 3. Once launching the app, users can see the screen marked 1. 
a gigantic button and the, and the label touched to Shazam. Visual simplicity? Yes, surely. People tap it and get the screen marks to listen. Once the song is identified, the third screen appears, which is simply the identified song with some info and actions such as share and like. Perfect design for Shazam's primary task. One, two, three, and you are there. True. Thereafter, you can enjoy a few secondary features, such as the get the top 10 chart. But these features are catered in a subdued fashion, and many other features are simply not there at all, such as, say, play music, search artists, simply out of scope. So here is an app with a well-defined primary task featuring visual simplicity and the fewest steps possible. Also, enterprise apps can walk this path have a distinct focus, omit extendable features, and therefore match the mobile state of mind. Let's talk now a bit about gesture, a dominant aspect of smartphones and tablets. As, as with all other interfaces, users interact with the mobile interface using gestures. While in desktop apps we speak about gestures such as click or drag and drop, such interfaces introduce a whole new set of gestures. For example, the text the counterpart of the good and old click, marked here as A. The swipe, marked here as B, and the pinch, C. However, the introduction of uh, the wholly new set of gestures raises the concern whether all of them are intuitive. Will users understand which one is expected of them at any point? Well, apparently, not all gestures are intuitive to the same extent. So, here, is a few, here are a few samples of common touch gestures divided into families based on their intuitiveness. It's a kind of a scale of intuitiveness for gesture family. So please look at the first family, mark one. We see here two sample members of this family, a button, which is of course supposed to be tapped, and a slider. This one is the slider that unlocks the iPhone, which is dragged. Both these elements feature a strong visual cue as to the expected gesture. Moreover, they employ physical world metaphors. For example, the button really looks like a physical button. Even a child knows it is meant to be tapped. And the slider imitates physical sliders as well, such as the uh, on-off slider button of a radio. This family of gestures is the most intuitive. Let's now consider the second family, marked two. A prominent member of the family is the pinched gesture, commonly used as maps and photos. No, there is no visual cue that calls for this gesture. However, once the gesture is accomplished for the first time, it becomes apparent that a photo is, in fact, a physical object. And subconsciously, we accept that had the physical photo been made of some elastic material, rubber-like, the pinch would have been the proper gesture. Therefore, in the aftermath that is going on in our mind, the pinch gesture vaguely relates to a physical metaphor, hence it will uh, be remembered and adopted. Now look at the third row. The representative gesture I picked for this family is the two-finger tap. It is used, for example, with net. A simultaneous two-finger tap results in zooming by a fixed quota. This gesture lacks any visual cue and furthermore has no physical interpretation whatsoever. Therefore, its intuitiveness is the lower. Let's consider two more gestures of the third less intuitive family, the one without any physical uh, interpretation. It is slide 11, yes. On the left, you can see the contact list of Android. A simple tab on the contact would result in another screen that offers two options, call the contact or text the contact. This is the straightforward behavior. However, swiping an, an individual contact from left to right results in an immediate phone call made to this contact. No questions asked. Swiping from right to left results in a text message editor per this contact. Therefore, these swipe gestures, which lack visual cues as well as any physical metaphor, serve as shortcuts to a more intuitive yet lengthy operation. And this is okay. Non-intuitive gestures are suitable as shortcut operations. Now let's move on to the right side of the slide and consider another non-intuitive gesture, the long press, also known as the tap and hold. A long press on a link, say in the mobile browser or within the Facebook app, well, such a long press would result in a pop-up offering a list of actions, actions 
such as opening a new window, bookmark link, and more. In fact, this is the touch equivalent of the right click. Provide context menu. You can also try a long press on some keys of the virtual keypad. For example, if you, you tap and hold the .com key, you'll get a choice of further URL extensions such as .org, .net, and the like. You'll be surprised as to how many people are unaware of the possibility to long press a link or long press a keypad key. But still, its use for these purposes is OK. It is perfectly fine to use less intuitive gestures when the related functionality is non-critical. An individual could operate the mobile browser in a reasonable way without ever using the long press pop-up action. Therefore, in summary, I recommend that in, in the enterprise apps you are creating, the use of non-intuitive gestures would be limited to shortcut and non-critical action. Speaking about gestures, it is vital that your mobile apps mimic the gestures of commonly used apps. Regardless of whether these gestures are intuitive or not, when users are already accustomed to them, they will expect them to work in similar circumstances and get disappointed if they find out that their gesture was attempted in vain. Take, for example, swiping a list item in order to delete it. This gesture belongs to the family of medium intuitiveness gestures since it lacks any visual cue and indeed is normally used as a shortcut, shortcut action. Anyway, as this swipe to remove is common in native iPhone apps, some users would perceive it as a standard behavior and will try it on any dynamic list. In order to avoid user disappointment, it is recommended to mimic such common practice gestures in any app. Up to now, I described the mobile state of mind and talked about gestures. Let's talk now about the comfort zone. People frequently operate their smartphones single-handed. This means that the phones are operated using the thumb. It is worth noticing that uh, it is not equally easy for the thumb to reach all areas of the screen. Please look at the smartphone. Three different areas are marked over it, pertaining to, the, to a right-handed user. The green zone is the easiest, easiest for the thumb to reach and is also known as the comfort zone. Note that with right-handed users, the thumb's position is to the right of the screen. The yellow zone poses some discomfort since the thumb needs to, to bend a lot in a somewhat unnatural posture. But still, the effort is not that dramatic. However, the top area, colored gray, requires the thumb to reach for it. In fact, not only the thumb, but also the palm itself has to twist and stretch in order to reach this zone. It is therefore named the reach zone. Ultimately, for a comfortable ergonomic experience, we should try and locate the most frequently used controls, the most critical controls, away from the reach zone. Let's now apply the comfort zone net onto the iPhone and Android operating systems and analyze the results. On the left, we see the map overlaid on top of the phone application of the iPhone. We can see that the key labeled 1 is out of the comfort zone. In the Android case, to the right, all keys seem to be well within the comfort zone. Take a closer look at the Android. There is a rather large unutilized black area above the keypad. Android designers could have used it to enlarge the keypad to the size of the iPhone keypad, thereby increase the size of each key. And you know that the larger the size, the smaller the error rate. But interestingly, they prefer to make the keys smaller in order to keep them all within the comfort zone. The thought behind it is that typing a phone number is a serial process, a quick sequence of gestures, and the effort to reach for the one key disrupts the sequence in a way that is not worth the extra size. But let's focus now on the tabs. The tab bars of both phones where user can switch to the call log, to contact, and so on. Let's start with the iPhone which has its tab bar at the bottom. We can see that this uh, tab bar is within uh, easy and medium uh, zones. Therefore, users can switch between their main goals rather easily. As for the Android that has its tab bar at the top, at least half of the tabs are out of the comfort zone and well into the reach zone, meaning that any time a user wants to switch between, say, dial pad and call log, his experience and tab accuracy degrades. 
Now, this usability issue is not confined just to uh, the phone application. It's part of the general scheme of the iPhone to have the tab bar at the bottom. And it is uh, the general scheme of the Android to have it, to have it at the top. Therefore, the Android overall scheme has an inherent drawback with regard to switching between tabs. And tabs are frequently critical user actions. I already briefly mentioned the importance of button size to the usability of apps. It's time to ask ourselves what is, in fact, the minimal tap target size. How large should the button or a list item be so that our finger won't miss it? Well, to start with, I thought it could be interesting to review the short history of recommendation and standards regarding touch screen button size. Back in year 2000, a research conducted by Nanan came up with the number 22 millimeters, or 0.86 inch, for the minimal button size. And this number was rather widely accepted for touch screen. On 2004, another research came up with 20 millimeters, rather similar. But the revolution is attributed to Parhi and uh, Bederson on uh, 2006. They were the first to test a thumb operation of a handheld touch device. And they came up with a significantly lower number, 9.6 millimeter or 0.37 inch. At the right-hand side of your, the slide, you can see one of the empirical charts they came up with. The y-axis describes the user error rate, and the x-axis, the target size. We can see that as the target size increases, the user error rate decreases. A kind of plateau is reached at 9.6 millimeters, hence their conclusion that 9.6 millimeters seems the minimal target size. At the lower section, you can see the current guidelines of Nokia, Windows Phone, and Apple. They went even farther and reduced the recommendation to 7 and 8 millimeters, or 0.27 inches or so. As you can see in the chart, the value of 7 millimeters practically doubles the error rate. This means that the Apple, Nokia, and Microsoft uh, push the limits. They sacrifice user errors so that more elements can be squeezed into the screen. Therefore, I recommend that the 7 millimeters or 0.27 inch minimum will be maintained at all costs. But furthermore, whenever possible, especially when it comes to critical actions, try to aim at 9 millimeters and achieve better task efficiency and better user experience. So, we have discussed gestures, a comfort zone, tap target size. Towards the end of my part in this webinar, let's talk about the constraints that a limited bandwidth network imposes on the user experience. Of course, I refer here to apps that retrieve data from servers. Limited bandwidth directly affects response time. So it is a good idea to first decide what would a good response time be. Please look at the first section, titled Past. Back in 84, Schneiderman, then a usability guru, set 15 seconds as what he defined as the tolerable wait time for computer interaction. Quite a long delay, I, I would say. But uh, as with many other things in life, also people's expectations matter. And expectation, expectations were different in those days. Later, in 96, Nielsen, an even greater guru, set the number at 10 seconds. Apparently, user expectations have changed a bit. Of course, he did not refer to mobile apps, but rather to desktop applications and websites, but the number is nevertheless applicable. In 1999, a research showed that 33% of site visitors drop off if the response time is larger than 8 seconds. This was known back then as the 8 seconds rule. Even in 2003, the tolerable wait time was set as high as 8.6 seconds. However, more recent findings reveal a different story. Apparently, expectations have changed. Let's look at the section labeled now. Akamai came up with the observation that 33% of site visitors drop off if response time is greater than 4 seconds. Remember that in 99, the response time that caused the same drop of rate was set at a double time, 8 seconds. At 2008, a research by Nebraska University further split the number in half, 2 seconds. You can extrapolate to predict the number that is probably applicable at the very present or in the very short future. Would it be 1 second? 
We can gain further insight if we look at two interesting findings. Here at the last section of this slide. In 2006, Google attempted to go for 30 results per page instead of the traditional 10 results per page. This caused extra 0.5 seconds of download time. Amazingly, this extra half a second resulted in 20% drop in traffic and revenue. Apparently, 0.5 seconds delay dramatically affect the experience. All this finding by Amazon. They observe that just a tiny increase of 100 milliseconds in response time decreases sales by 1%. This gives a valuable insight as to how important the response time is. So, next networks with limited bandwidth pose a challenge. Apparently, even a tenth of a second counts. Moreover, slow response time is one of the two most common user complaints, the other being unclear navigation. Poor response time impacts the measurable efficiency of the performance of the task. But more than that, slow response time affects the perceived efficiency, the subjective perception of efficiency. People simply hate, hate to wait. When a per person performs steps toward the goal, any goal, any split second delay irritates him or her. And of course, lastly, past a certain attention threshold, users simply bail out. So let's look at some techniques that may help us to cope with the limited bandwidth challenge. The first technique is the gradual retrieve. Retrieve additional information only when the user actively indicates his interest in further information. Look, for example, at the Facebook app to the left. Once the user launches the app, only a segment of the news feed info is retrieved from the server, obviously the most updated segment. Therefore, a relatively short response time is achieved. Only if the user actively expresses interest in older posts by tapping the older posts link, a new download occurs. Same goes for the Gmail app to the right. Only a segment of the inbox is downloaded in favor of response time. Only those users who are interested in older emails that show more messages and wait a bit more. Another technique that may be employed is the background retrieve. Check out this to-do app. On the left screenshot, you can see the first screen user sees upon launch. It provides a summary of all the to-dos. Six, six tasks need to be done today, five tomorrow, etc. Now, what is the most probable item a user would tap? I think that many users would tap the most urgent one, today. Therefore, a cleverly designed app would already retrieve today's specific tasks in the background. While the user still glances at the first screen, this way, once the today item is clicked, voila, prompt response. The last technique I'll describe here is the concurrent retrieve. Look at Craigslist app. Text and graphics are retrieved in parallel, as if from two independent sources. Naturally, the text arrives first, featuring a short response time, and is therefore displayed first. We can witness it on the left screenshot. Then, one by one, the pictures arrive and are inserted one by one into the screen, as we can see in the right screenshot. The perceived response time greatly improves. Okay. Up to now, mobile user experience characteristics and guidelines were discussed. I'll now hand over the mic to Amit Ben Schiffer, Director of Product Management at Worklight, for a discussion of application design in a fragmented mobile world. Hi, everyone, and Joram, thanks a lot for your fascinating presentation. Um, you discussed some universal aspects in designing to mobile devices, designing for small screens and for touch interfaces. Now, I would like to focus on the implications of the fragmentation in the mobile landscape and designing a user interface. With so many mobile devices now available, the iPhone, iPad, Android smartphones and tablets, library devices, Windows Phone 7, and so on, and I'll show some practical steps you can take to address this challenge. The two main considerations are form factor, specifically phones and tablets, and the mobile operating systems, which can significantly affect the way an application looks and behaves on the device. 
A very common web design technique is to stretch the user interface to support screens of various resolutions. However, compare the iPhone to the iPad, for example. The area of the iPhone screen is 5.75 square inches. The area of the iPad screen is 48.5 square inches, which is over eight times larger than the iPhone. Similarly, the BlackBerry Playbook is four times larger than the BlackBerry Torch, and if you compare it to other BlackBerry phone models, you will get even a higher ratio. So clearly, you, you can't just stretch the user interface designed for a small screen and expect it to look decent on a screen which is four to eight times larger. Since tablet screens are larger than phone screens, they display more information per screen. However, this does not mean showing only more of the same info, but also showing a more complex per screen model and consequently flatten information hierarchy. Flattened hierarchies helps reduce the number of steps necessary to reach the desired piece of information. It also helps show the context of the information, which can greatly simplify the navigation and orientation within the app. Consider this app from Epicurious.com. The iPad app not only displays more search results on the screen, but it also provides the context, that is, the fish category, which is uh, reading and trays in this case, and other navigation options as vertical tabs on the right. Yet another way to take advantage of the large tablet size is to place even richer and more compelling graphics on the screen. In the Bloomberg app shown on the screen, the iPhone app displays an effective but rather small graph showing the stock behavior. The iPad version displays seven different graphs Preferring in size according to relevance, giving the user a much broader picture at a glance. OK, so let's talk now about some mechanisms that can help us to adjust the mobile phone user interface to tablet screens, uh, while still keeping as much code as possible common across form factors. Um, just one note for the less technical people in the audience. You will not see another slide with so much code in it, so please bear with us. Adjusting the size of user interface elements to different sizes of screens is commonly achieved by using relative values in CSS style. CSS3, however, introduces a strong mechanism called media queries. Media queries allow you to apply styles based on properties of the medium on which the HTML page is displayed. So practically, this enables you to control the complete layout of the screen, and not only to change relative size or position of screen of screen elements. For example, you can place the styles governing the position of screen elements for tablets in a separate file, and apply it based on the size of the screen width. This is depicted in the first line. The file iPad.css contains all styles for elements appearing on the tablet screen and is loaded by the browser only if the screen width is 768 pixels or higher. Similarly, you can also specify separate screen layouts for portrait and landscape orientations by adding lines like shown in the second example. This is especially useful for tablet applications in which the layout in portrait mode contains different UI elements than those displayed in landscape mode, such as the Epicurious app shown uh, before. And of course, you can also apply styles from JavaScript. So here, for example, is the event handler for the orientation change event fired by the browser. When you develop your app with the WordPress Studio, you can create schemes to package tablet-specific resources and phone-specific resources, and then apply the correct set of resources on the device according to device properties. The skins mechanism in WorkLite is simple yet very flexible. The WorkLite Studio allows you to organize your web resources in folders, including the Common folder, the iPhone, Android, iPad, and BlackBerry folders, and also any custom folder you wish to create. Then you can also define the order of inheritance of these folders, where each inheritance chain defines a single skin. So here's an example for an effective use of this mechanism. In the example displayed on the screen, you will place in the common folder general application code 
which is common to all types of devices and all operating systems. Um, this code will usually include the logic for authenticating users, retrieving information from enterprise applications, uh, processing user actions, and generating information to be displayed on the screen. In two additional custom folders, tablet and phone, um, you will place custom presentation logics applicable to the two respective form factors. And then in the two folders, iPhone and Android, uh, we will place custom presentation and device access logic for these two operating systems. Now, the iPad scheme is generated by making the resources in the iOS folder inherit from the tablet folder and making them inherit from the common folder. The iPhone scheme is generated by inheriting from the phone folder instead of the tablet folder. And similarly, the Android tablet and phone schemes are created. So in this example, code related, code related to phone factor is segregated from the code related to mobile operating system. And this allows organizing the code in a clean way and reusing it efficiently to create four different schemes. Schemes are indeed a great way to create universal applications that can be installed on any device and adjust themselves automatically to the device. But sometimes it is useful to create unique applications for tablet, especially when the tablet version of the app contains significant features that are missing from the phone version or completely not relevant to it. This is particularly useful for iPad apps, and because of this, WorldRack also provides a separate optimization environment for the iPad. So using the iPad environment, you can create apps that are packaged separately for the iPad. Of course, you can still leverage the code in the common folder, so you do not need to replicate the entire app code, but only write your iPad-specific code under the iPad folder. OK, so we have covered the main differences between the phone and tablet form factor and went through three mechanisms to write efficient code for handling both form factors. Let's consider now the other main difference across mobile devices, the mobile operating system. Navigation across screens within, the, within an app is an important factor in the design of the app user interface. Mobile operating systems promote unique navigation paradigm, often backed up with dedicated controls or hardware. Um, let's take iOS, for example. iOS has a widely used tabbar appearing at the bottom of the screen, uh, which is often used to access the main application screen. Uh, this can be seen at the bottom of the screenshot of the WhatsApp Messenger application for iPhone. To navigate to lower level screens, iOS apps use a small right pointing arrow appearing on each expandable item. Now, navigation back to the main screen or to the previous one is done by tapping the back button, which is shaped as a left pointing arrow and appears on the top navigation bar. Android apps, on the other hand, can make extensive use of the hardware buttons for navigation. We see here the same WhatsApp Messenger application for Android. The WhatsApp developers chose to use the device's hardware menu button to invoke the menu option, which is here equivalent to the iOS tab bar. Also, unlike iOS, Android apps do not normally place a visual indicator on items which can be drilled down. So users are expected to try click clicking items to find that out. And navigation back in the hierarchy is always performed using the device's hardware back button. Therefore, the Android WhatsApp app has room for um, Jeff Lynn's image on the top left corner of the screen that we see in this example. Now, another aspect in which mobile operating systems differ from each other is in the style of form controls. The example shown on the screen demonstrates controls that are particular to iOS and later on to Android. And look, for example, on the iOS on-off switch. This metaphor is used in many iOS screens to replace the good old checkbox. Using it makes users feel at home with the application and helps them immediately associate this control with long-term settings. Another example is the iOS selector component. Again, this component has been first introduced by iOS 
to best exploit the touch interface. Uh, ironically, even though users find this control sometimes cumbersome to handle compared to other choices, application developers often prefer to use it in their apps because it feels so native to the iPhone user experience. Now, the Android operating system does not introduce Start UI components as iOS does. However, their phone controls are subtly stylized to make users easily understand their function. For example, look on the distinctive circular shape of the drop-down control, or compare the disabled and enabled mode of the standard Android checkbox. Also note how the standard buttons at the bottom of the screen share the same style as the checkbox, so you can so they look like a family of controls and contribute to a consistent look and feel inside the application. Some operating systems promote the use of unique controls for specific purposes. Uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, we see the iPhone Facebook application. Like many other iOS apps, uh, this app, too, has a top navigation bar. In the Facebook example, the navigation bar has two buttons. The left button provides access to the main application menu, and the right button allows the user to get the latest data from Facebook. Placing these buttons on the navigation bar greatly helps iPhone users because they expect the navigation bar to help them access related application feeds or to perform very common tasks. By the way, the, the iPhone navigation bar is such a successful design element that developers adopted it also when designing apps to other mobile operating systems, like Android. Another original iOS feature is the red notification badges shown at the bottom. Using the standard iOS component on the right button in the bottom panel, developers of the Facebook app instantly deliver the notion that something new is waiting for the user and that the user is expected to tap the left button in order to access this new content. The Windows Phone operating system also introduces some unique user interface components. A very original component is the pivot control. This control enables users to sequentially browse through different screens of the same application by swiping a finger horizontally either left or right. The control also shows the edge of the next screen to provide some kind of a preview of what's expected. Um, you, you could really argue that a tab bar is usually more appropriate for easy access to the main application screens because it provides random access to each screen and makes the most important options displayed evidently to the user. However, using the pivot control replicates the experience of navigating within the standard operating system screen, and therefore it simplifies the overall user experience because it keeps it consistent and does not demand from users even the slightest effort to recall a unique navigation paradigm each time they use the application. The last difference I would like to mention is something many people forget to consider. Each mobile operating system uses a different default font and sometimes supports a very limited number of other fonts, if at all. So here again, it is highly advised and sometimes it is, it is even a must to use the default operating system font or at least a formally supported font to ensure that text will render well on all devices. You still have to note that different fonts occupy different space so that text that fits inside a button using one font may overflow using a different font. But anyway, such problems can be easily detected when testing the application. So now you may be asking yourself, how do I go about supporting multiple mobile operating systems from a user experience perspective? Do I have to adjust the application for each OS? How hard is it? Well, broadly speaking, you have three options. Maybe the most straightforward option is to replicate your application user interface across all target devices. Um, there is an obvious benefit to this approach, which is cost saving. If your app is not overly complex in terms of navigation, it might even be a reasonable trade-off. And if you choose this option, it's probably best to stick to the iPhone screen design and navigation paradigms uh, because these are at least unofficially considered 
be de facto mobile design paradigms for smartphones. Another option is to create your own screen design and navigation paradigms, differentiating them significantly from those of the operating system, and then reusing them across all target devices and operating systems. Now, you can achieve exceptional UI, like the ING Direct Front application on the left, which enables delivery of a consistent application across all devices while promoting um, the ING brand in a unique way. However, uh, there is risk associated with this approach, as you can see in, in one of the Craigslist applications on the right, where the end results may be highly unsatisfactory. So pick this option only if you are willing to invest significantly in unique user experience, as results can either be excellent or very poor. Well, the third option is to do what most app developers do, uh, which is to adjust your application to the mobile operating system. The benefit of this approach is that you create an app which is easier to use um, and helps users focus on, perform on performing their tasks rather than on recollecting how to find features in your app. The level of adjustment can depend on your specific application and on the amount of effort that you are willing to invest. Now remember, as user experience guru Jacob Nielsen noted, a mobile app won't get used unless it's part of an integrated user experience hosted by the device. So let's go over some mechanisms that can make your life much easier and greatly reduce your development effort when implementing multi-platform mobile applications. Um, let's start with maybe the simplest way to use native controls um, by leveraging HTML5 controls. Since the browser is implemented natively, it renders HTML controls natively. This means that even the simplest controls, such as edit boxes, password boxes, checkboxes, and radio buttons, will match the look and feel of each mobile operating system. And this is clearly shown in the example. Um, this also holds for HTML5 controls. Look, for example, on the slider and date picker on the BlackBerry operating system 6 browser. And this is mostly apparent when rendering the mobile equivalent to combo boxes. Stylizing a combo box to match the operating system's uh, style is performed effortlessly by simply using the HTML markup. Uh, unlike using straight HTML controls, using JavaScript UI toolkits such as jQuery Mobile can help you achieve the same look and feel across different mobile operating systems adjusted to touch screens. With jQuery Mobile, you can create an iconized list of items, um, for example, as like the one that is shown on the screen, just by linking to some jQuery CSS and JavaScript files, and then specifying this simple HTML markup. So, and the jQuery framework will automatically take care of stylizing the list for you. Now, an alternative to jQuery Mobile is um, Sensor Touch, for example, which is another JavaScript toolkit that helps you achieve the same goal, easily creating a consistent mobile user interface across multiple mo mobile platforms. With Sensor Touch, you do not write HTML markup, but rather write simple JavaScript code as displayed on the screen. The result of, the, of this particular code will be, will be the, the group list that is displayed next to it. Again. All the styling is taken care of automatically by the Sensor Touch framework. Um, let's move now on to the next mechanism. Having a uniform API in JavaScript that provides you access to useful native OS controls is a great idea. And work like implement such an API for several components. Here you can see um, the result of invoking WL dot simple dialog on iOS, Android, and Windows Phone, providing title, text, and an array of buttons for the dialog. So you see, um, the same code generates completely different looking um, dialogs on each uh, mobile operating system. And here, 
is the result of invoking WL.BZ indicator on the same operating system. The horizontally spaced dots in the Windows Phone app actually move across the screen, by the way. A unified API for tab bar is also useful to leverage uh, for iOS and Android apps. And access to the native options menu is available for Android and in the upcoming WordPress release also to Windows Phone. And finally, before we move to the Q&A, um, when you have special requirements and need to implement features that make the utmost use of the mobile device, like the augmented reality screen shown now, you sometimes have no choice but to turn to native implementation. Now, this indeed hampers cross-compatibility, but if done only where needed, the overall impact on multi-platform compatibility can be low. Still, one thing should still be simple and done uniformly in all mobile operating systems, uh, which is the ability to integrate this native code with your JavaScript code. WorkLight provides an easy-to-use API exactly for that, allowing you to switch to native screens from web pages, transfer data between the screens, and share cookies and the session with the WorkLight server. All these methodologies, methodologies come together to help you overcome the fragmented mobile landscape as you implement your mobile app strategy. Thank you, Amit, and thank you, Yoram. A great presentation, very detailed and useful. Uh, we've been receiving some of your questions already, and please feel free um, to submit them through the console. Um, I'll kick off with the first question uh, received here. How does uh, the user experience differ when developing purely native versus web-based applications? Uh, Amit, maybe you want to start with uh, this question. Um, well, today, or web technologies have, have significantly advanced to provide a very close um, uh, level of user interface that greatly resembles um, native user experience and can reach and can reach uh, um, the level of, of native applications um, for most purposes. And I'm talking about um, the ability to stylize user interface elements, um, the ability to animate screens, the ability to animate um, controls, or, or uh, and of course to 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 design the screens in any way. Um, there are uh, some things that you will uh, probably find harder to achieve consistently using um, web technologies. For example, if you have very um, advanced animation, um, uh, you, may, you may find that implementing it using web technologies may not uh, work as smoothly on, uh, on uh, older devices which uh, less strong CPU or with weaker CPUs or with uh, or other operating systems. Great, thank you. The next question, uh, can the work right powered apps uh, support these advanced gestures uh, you mentioned in the presentation? I'll take it. Yeah, the answer for that is yes. Um, you can either do it through um, in, uh, frameworks like PhoneGap um, and some other and some JavaScript toolkits like jQuery Mobile, um, both are supported by WorkLight, um, and these give you provide you events out of the box for gestures, um, and you can also um, implement that yourself. You can catch, patch, and accelerometer events and analyze gestures in your code. So you can do that. Yes. Great. Uh, here's another question, actually, around gestures. Um, what is your opinion of the uh, regarding the shake gesture that is common in smartphones? Is this appropriate for an, an enterprise application? Uh, Yoram, please uh, go ahead and address this. If you may. Sure. Um, but I think that the shake gesture, shaking of the smartphone device, uh, should be employed sparingly, if at all. Well, unless we are speaking about music apps or games, 
By the way, it seems that uh, Apple is standardizing it as undo. Try typing some SMS characters and then shaking your iPhone, and you'll see. But even for this purpose, it is a questionable gesture. It is easy to activate it by mistake. And it is not really scalable to larger devices, such as the iPad. Um, moreover, shaking the device during a task causes temporary loss of focused eye contact with the screen, um, not to mention the severe interruption to any user input. So in summary, I would suggest that uh, this gesture would be handled with care. Great. Uh, another question. What value does uh, application skinning provide on top of uh, media queries? Uh, okay, that's for me. Um, well, skinning is not instead of media query, um, but on top of it. And actually, it allows a more flexible mechanism for deciding which skin to apply. With media query, um, you are limited to the properties that are supported by CSS3. With skinning, you can actually query um, the device um, and decide which skin to um, to apply based on any device property or any other logics that you, that you feel convenient and, and actually perform a very complex logic if you wish. Um, so this is one benefit. Um, another benefit is um, with skins you can also um, include separate HTML files and scripts. Um, you cannot do that with media query. You cannot load HTML files and scripts using, using media query. Um, so skins provide you more control over the design layout and also the logic that you incorporate within each skin. And finally, it also provides you a way to organize all your assets and a way to um, minimize um, the code that you need to write for each skin because of the work rate, uh, uh, the work rate mechanism that allows you to inherit um, um, logic across or uh, in logic across across the different folders as as described during the presentation. Thank you. Uh, here's a question from a financial services um, organization. Uh, we're considering integrating more complex capabilities using uh, the camera and the accelerometer. Uh, is there any disadvantage to using these uh, native device capabilities? Um, I think this one is for Yoram. Go ahead. OK. Disadvantages. Um, in fact, I think that some of the most successful apps integrate with the uh, device sensors. Uh, users feel that such apps put power in their hands, power that uh, they were not able to experience before. Therefore, um, whenever possible and appropriate, I would recommend integrating device sensors into the functionality of your apps, such as GPS, camera, mic, speaker, accelerometer. Uh, I would also add that integration with the phone's uh, native apps is beneficial as well, such as uh, integration with the calendar, uh, the messaging platform, uh, or the browser. It all contributes, uh, I think, to the overall user experience and user satisfaction. And therefore, my answer is uh, go ahead, try and integrate uh, with the native device capabilities. Yeah, maybe I can add a few words here. Um, if you want to integrate native device capabilities, it doesn't mean that you have to write uh, native code because um, you have um, access to some native device capabilities like the GPS, for example, from the browser um, through HTML5. Um, you also have access through PhoneGap, which provides you JavaScript interface to device capabilities uh, like the, the camera for, for shooting still pictures, uh, the accelerometer, and the compass. Um, and you do need to, to write your own native code or to, to link with some native library if you want to use um, the video camera or the microphone or stuff like that. 
Great, thank you. What is the best approach for accessing data from enterprise backend systems? Uh, do some approaches lend, them, lend themselves uh, better for mobile apps? Um, okay, I take it. I think that um, it depends on, on which layer of the protocol um, you you speak. I mean, obviously, we're talking about accessing data over HTTP, and then there is a question of how to format the data. Um, if you um, if you consider the the network, the three G network used by by most phones, you have to. to have to take uh, in consideration that it's not as fast as broadband networks, so um, you would rather use a a, a thin a thin formatting for your data so that you don't um, pay for unnecessary markup. Um, for example, WorkSite uses JSON as the format to transfer data between the WorkSite server, uh, which collects data from the backend applications. Um, to the to the mobile device and JSON is very um, uh, light on markup. Um, you also have um, another thing that you have to consider is how to um, hide as much as possible the, com the integration complexities from the mobile developer. Um, preferably, you will want the mobile developer to um, focus on getting the data, extracting the information from it, and, and just use it for the app and not, uh, uh, pay, not consider things like how to open the transactions, close the transactions, um, extract um, data from, from uh, proprietary protocols and things like that. And uh, the third thing that uh, uh, our customers at least found important is how to reduce the number of calls um, invoked uh, the, the number of requests invoked by the um, by the mobile device. Each request has its own latency, and if you invoke many requests um, to different uh, enterprise services to display data on a single screen, then you end up with uh, quite a poor response time. So here, um, so usually the solution is to perform to com to perform one request to a central server, and to com the server um, makes uh, many requests on behalf of the user to the several enterprise services, uh, combines the results into a single response, and then uh, returns it to the to the mobile device. So this greatly helps in reducing the overall latency and increasing and reducing the response. Great, thank you. Um, then a question around uh, the differences between the tab bar versus the option, uh, the options menu in Android. And we're uh, just about coming up uh, towards the end of the session. I think we have room for about two questions or so. Okay, so the differences between the tab bar and the options menu in Android. Okay, these are actually two different components, obviously, and they are usually used for different things. Tab bar is uh, the native metaphor in Android for um, for screen-based navigation. Um, it's 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 a it's a control that is provided by the operating system, um, and it's displayed permanently, meaning it occupies permanent screen space, um, while the options menu is usually um, a, a menu that provides context-sensitive um, actions depending on the state screen. Um, and in order to access it, the user has to click, like to perform an, an explicit action. Um, so you should use the tab bar when you have multi-screen applications, unless space is so critical that you can't afford wasting it on the tab bar. And you should use the options menu um, for navigation, that is, as a replacement for the tab bar, only if navigation is so infrequent, um, so it's worth, it's worth the extra user action. Great, thank you. Next question. What is your opinion on the Flash Flex platform on mobile devices compared to native and web browser-based uh, approaches? 
uh, with, with regard to gestures, uh, user experiences, and, and other features. Okay, so actually there's uh, a lot of progress that is being made now um, to make uh, Flash, to increase the usability of Flash um, on mobile devices. Um, from what we've seen, the extent of support or the extent of usability of Flash across devices um, varies tremendously um, depending on, on operating system and device models. Um, obviously, when, when, when a device um, supports Flash well, then it looks great and behaves very well, but unfortunately, not too many of them um, do that. Uh, at this moment, uh, not to mention iPhone and, I, and iPad, which do not support Flash at all. Um, another thing that you want to consider, by the way, is something that Adobe just recently um, announced, which is um, the ability to use Flex and then create um, web applications out of it. Um, so this could also be an option. Um, if you have uh, um, Flash and Flex and, and Flex experience in house, and you want to leverage it for the, for, for uh, creating um, um, mobile applications, great. Thank you. Uh, and a final question: uh, We would like to know the general opinion um, on how to handle a tablet, since the screen resolution is similar to that of a desktop. Is there really a need for a uh, quote unquote native experience? Um, Yoram, would you like to address this? Yes, sure. Um, okay, I, I'd say that uh, there is one major factor here that uh, should be taken into account, and uh, it's the uh, tech target size, which we discussed before. I mean, uh, the uh, tablet like an iPad has indeed a resolution that is similar to some desktop monitors. However, uh, it uh, operates using uh, touch, therefore it should uh, uh, work along the guidelines of uh, tap target size and therefore uh, regular controls, desktop controls, uh, simply won't work there, for example. Uh, the combo uh, button, uh, drop down button is too small, uh, buttons are too small, lists are surely too small. Therefore, if only for that reason, uh, a native uh, user experience has to be uh, developed. Moreover, um, even generally speaking, uh, there is a, a de facto um, convention to the way uh, the uh, and tablets, touch screens should behave. And uh, if we would come up with an application that uh, behaves and looks differently, uh, people will, uh, will not take it uh, seriously, I think. Um, and therefore, in summary, I think that yes, uh, it is uh, critical, I'd say, to make sure that uh, the experience we uh, provide to the app that we develop uh, is consistent with the uh, um, the, actually, the guidelines that uh, uh, are uh, well established for touch tablets. Great. Thank you, Yoram, and thank you, Amit, and thank you, everyone, for joining us for this uh, session. I invite you to visit uh, both our websites uh, at worktag.com and at five.co.il for uh, additional resources. We will make this presentation and webinar available to all registrants. Thank you.